This morning we're going to begin a, a series of teachings on the book of Deuteronomy. In the book of Acts, there was a, Paul was on his itineraries uh, going throughout uh, the area of um, Greece, and he ended up going to Athens, and he was there by himself in Athens. And as he was walking through the city, it says in Acts 17, 16, that now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him as he was observing the city full of idols. Uh, Athens at that time was the great cultural center of the world. It was from Athens that the great philosophers, uh, in quote, uh, great philosophers, uh, Socrates and, and Plato and Aristotle came from there and their influences had gone through the world. There was an arrogance about their knowledge that existed in Athens and and it was obviously a place of uh, religious idolatry, and polytheism was rampant there. And Paul was really stirred in the spirit by this. And, and as a result of this, he went up to a place called Mars Hill. Mars Hill was a place where the philosophers would gather together, and they would do nothing all day but talk about philosophical things. And, uh, and uh, Paul, walking up there, as he goes up the road, he sees all of these idols on each side of the road. There's one here, there's one there, and he's walking up there. All the way up to Mars Hill, he sees these idols, and he comes across this one, which underneath it, it said, to the unknown God. So when he gets up there, for while I was passing through, and he's talking to these guys, passing through and explaining the objects of your, examining the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. I thought, what a wonderful opening way to get it going with these boys that knew everything. And uh, he's going to talk to them about the unknown God. Unfortunately, we still live in a time where so much is not known about the true God, where there is so much ignorance and so much wrong teaching about the one true God. And because of that, and for other reasons, we want to begin to examine the book of Deuteronomy, because it's in the book of Deuteronomy and the other books that are in the beginning of the Bible, the first five books, which are called the, the Torah or the Pentateuch, they, the first five books is when really God makes known to the world who he is. And Deuteronomy is a great book for the, just that purpose and, and helping us to understand what is so often for so many the unknown God. And when it comes to the subject of understanding God, uh, the beginning of, there's a few things I'd just like to set before you that kind of are imperative for knowing God. Uh, and these are written on that card that you your notes, Yahweh reveals himself to those who want to know him. One of the, the fundamental important things about God, everybody has an opinion about God. Everybody thinks there's a God, even if, or even, even those who maybe are atheists, they, they still think about God, just that he doesn't exist. So everybody's got an opinion about God. But if you really want to know him, it begins with desire. Do you want to know? Because the scriptures make perfectly clear, emphatically, those who seek him, he will let them find him. Those who search for them, he is not hiding. He wants you to know him. So, you know, to have the desire to know God. So many of us get satisfied with our understanding. And he's so vast, he's so huge. Whatever your understanding in is, is it's minuscule to what the fullness of our God is. And then the next point is, Yahweh makes himself known primarily, but certainly not exclusively, through the scriptures. The scriptures are the way that, that God has decided to communicate his word. And again, one of the great reasons that we're beginning this study in the book of Deuteronomy is because in those opening books of the Bible is really where God reveals to the world about who he is. Ironically, many Christians start their study of, of the Bible with the, go the Gospels in the New Testament. And many Christians never get back to the Old Testament. It's, it's not a surprise to me that many people believe that Jesus is God 
because they don't have the underpinnings of where Yahweh explains to the world who he is. And there, there's, a, there's reasons for this misunderstanding. Jesus is not God. He's the Son of God. God is the... Well, we'll look at in Deuteronomy some of the great things that it tells us about who God is. And then uh, another point is to understand Yahweh requires not only knowledge, but firsthand experience. You have to experience Him. It's not just intellect. You have to put the Scripture into practice. You've got to do what he tells us to do, and in doing it, he reveals himself to you in a more fuller, complete way. You know, um, you, can, you can go, you can do that online dating, which I'm very adept at. <laughs> no, I know nothing at all about it, but I, I, I certainly have talked to people who have done online dating, and what I understand is, is that there can be things communicated on the computer that aren't necessarily true in reality. <laughs> So this tall, dark, handsome guy with a full head of hair shows up, and he's four foot tall, and he's bald, and he's chubby, you know. But, but the, the <laughs> it, it, isn't until, it isn't until you meet the person and you spend time with the person that you really get to know the person. It's just not about reading about them. You got to experience them. And, and all of the different life experiences that you go through will teach you something new about that person. It's the same thing with God. You have to experience Him. It's not only just reading about Him. Reading is the beginning of it, for sure. And then God magnifies Himself to us and so that we can know Him because of His great grace and mercy. Understanding Yahweh is restricted because of our human limitations and His boundless, list, boundless exhaustiveness. He is too big and we are way too small to understand Him. Ironically, yesterday I got to uh, speak with somebody about God and about Jesus Christ. And the reason I did is the person said to me, he said, you know, I was looking up, he, I was looking up into the sky this week and I saw the sun and I thought to myself, that can't just be. There's got to be a greater power than I'm aware of. And, you know, he started talking about the, the vastness of the universe. And, and then uh, from that... And, you know, here's a picture of the Milky Way galaxy. And uh, I, I thought that this was pretty astute, that God was starting to work with this, this gentleman. Uh, and I, it made me think of the Milky Way galaxy. And I, 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 I got online, I asked how many stars are in the Milky Way galaxy. And the computer, I looked at a diff number of different sites. One site said there's 300 billion. Another site said there's 400 billion. And another site said there's a trillion. Boy, that's really exact, isn't it? <laughs> There's a lot of stars in the Milky Way. And then one, one site says for every star that's in the Milky Way galaxy, let's take the low end of it, 300 billion. For every star that's in the galaxy, there is another galaxy somewhere in the expanse. Come on. <laughs> and people don't believe there's a God. You'd be a knucklehead if you don't believe there's a God. Come on now. You can't look at that. So then he says to me, he said, why did, why did God, Jesus' father, have him die? He said, that doesn't seem right to me that a father would have his son die. And then I was, you know, what a wonderful opportunity to explain that to him, which I did. But I, I, my point in, in saying this to you is that God is vast. He is huge. And we are small. Whatever is in your head about God it's minuscule to the reality of God. But we can gain great insight if we go to the Scriptures and read the Scriptures and hunger for God and ask Him to teach us, open up our eyes, open up our... He wants us to know Him. He really does. And if we hunger for Him, He will do that for us. I'm reminded of this great verse and one of my favorite verses in the book of Romans. Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. His, how, un, how unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Who, has became, who became his counselor? Who has first given to him that it should be given back to him again? For from him and through him 
and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. And I, I, he is so glorious. You know, I, I really appreciated, Peter, that song you sang about uh, hallelujah, that piece there. And uh, I, was, I, was, I was thinking of asking you, before I went too much further, if we could all sing that together a cappello. Come on up and let's do that. At least you might as well join them. Where are you? And I want everybody just to, just those, you know, you got to get us started and then stop playing the piano and then we'll all sing together. Hallelujah. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much, but I've nothing else fit for a king, except for a heart singing hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you very much. It pleases God for his people to sing and to praise him. So if we do nothing else this morning, I'm glad we did that. <laughs> Please turn to Deuteronomy. The word Deuteronomy means second law. The, the word itself means, uh, as far as I understand, it's a, from the Greek, it means second law. The first law was given in Exodus, and this is the second time. And the reason it's uh, communicated is it's a, a new generation of people. In, in uh, Deuteronomy 1.3, it says, In the 40th year, on the first day of the 11th month, Moses spoke to the children of Israel, according to all that the Lord had commanded him to give them. What, what the storyline is, of course, we're looking at Deuteronomy, but there are these other books that come before. In the book of Exodus, God leads them through, with Moses, God leads them out of Egypt and into the wilderness. And that first year that they're in the wilderness, they, he brings them to this place called Kadesh Barnea, and he wants them to go into this promised land that he has for them. But they don't, they don't do what God asks them to do. And uh, they wanted to spy out the land. They wanted to send in people, one, one person from each tribe, there's 12 tribes, to go in and spy out the land that they were going to go in and take control of. This land that God had promised to their forefathers and to them. And so they go in and they spy out the land and they look at the land and they come back. And they report to the people, they say, it's a beautiful land, it's rich, they brought back some of the fruit, but man, there's no way we can take this thing. I mean, there's giants in there. There's, 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 they've got their cities are highly fortified. There's Anakin in there. These are, there's giants in there. We're, we can't go in there. They'll kill us all. And they, they, these, these uh, men, they, uh, they frightened the people. And the people refused to t do what God told them to do, which was to go into the promised land. So now, for every, year that, for every day that they went in to spy out the land, which was 40 days, they were going to spend 40, one year for every day. So they ended up being 40 years in the wilderness. Now, this is the, this is the 11th month of the 40th year. This is the, the, the first day of the 11th month. Is that what it said, right? Verse 3. On the 40th year, on the first day of the 11th month, Moses spoke to the children of Israel. So it's right before they're going into the promised land. Moses himself is going to die very shortly. All of the people that are going into this, this promised land, they're, they're, they're young and they're, there's no grandparents. All of, the, all of their fathers died in the wilderness except for Joshua and Caleb. They're the two oldest guys. Everybody else died in the wilderness. It's a new generation. And because it's a new generation, God had Moses to tell them the law again. 
That's why it's second law. He's, he's repeating a lot of what was communicated in the book of Exodus. And he's also telling them what happened as to, you know, those, why they didn't go in at first and why they were in the wilderness. And, and so it's a, it's a great book. But throughout the book, God reveals a lot about himself, which I, I particularly am very fond of. And uh, look at in Deuteronomy again, verse, verse 10 or verse 6. And then uh, the Lord our God, and that word Lord is the word Yahweh. Yahweh our God spoke to us at Horeb saying, we have stayed here long enough at this mountain. He's reflecting back to when they first came out of Egypt. They're at the Mount of Horeb. He says, okay, now it's time for us to go. And we're going to move and go into the promised land. As I said, they refused to go. But notice those words, the Lord our God. Verse 10, it says, the Lord your God has multiplied you, and behold, you are this day like the stars in the heaven in number. There's many of them. Verse 11 says, May the Lord, the God of your fathers, increase you a thousandfold more. Look at verse 19, the latter part of that, or verse 19. Then we set from Horeb. We went through all the great and terrible wilderness which you saw on the way to the hill country of the Amorites, just as the Lord our God, Yahweh our God, has commanded us. Verse 20, I said to you, you have come to the hill country of the Amorites, which the Yahweh our God is about to give us. Verse 21, see Yahweh your God. Verse 25, the latter part of that verse it is good that the land which Yahweh our God is about to give us. Verse 26, And yet you have, were not willing to go up, but you rebelled against the commandment of Yahweh your God. Verse 30, Yahweh your God. Verse 31, In the wilderness where you saw how Yahweh your God. Verse 32, But with all of this you did not trust Yahweh your God. Do you get the, re did you see the redundancy there? That he repeated it over and over again. He really wants them to understand that Yahweh is their God. As a matter of fact, the word Yahweh is written 550 times in what these 32 or 33 book chapters. How many chapters are there? 35, 30 something, what is it? 35, right? No, 34. In 34 chapters, the word Yahweh is written 550 times. The words, the words uh, Yahweh your God or Yahweh uh, our God, 301 times. God wanted them to understand that there were no other gods for them. Their God was Yahweh. Yahweh your God. Yahweh your God. Yahweh your God. Why would he be so redundant with them? Why did he have to do that? Because their forefathers, their parents, their parents and their grandparents believed that Yahweh was just one of many gods. They came out of a society where polytheism was rampant, where the, the, the pantheon of Egypt, with all, they had more gods in the, in the, in the ancient world in Egypt than, than any other of the uh, ancient societies. And these people came into the wilderness, even though Yahweh led them out with all these miracles, they came in there believing, yeah, he's God, Yahweh's God, but he's only one of many. Shortly after being out of Egypt, a couple of months later, they build a golden calf in Moses' absence. You remember this, right? They're worshiping a golden calf. How can they do that? Well, they're doing that because they think that, yeah, Yahweh is God, but he's only one. We have the sun God. We have the moon God. We have the God of fertility. We have the God of, you know, agriculture and so on. So he's really, and that's why all of those people died. All their parents and their grandparents died in the wilderness because they were, they were idolaters. Now he's saying to them, okay, it's a new generation. You're going into the promised land. These are the last words of this great man, Moses, that God's inspiring him, and he's saying to him, get it through your head. There's only one God, and that God is Yahweh. Yahweh our God. 
I guess uh, we should regress a little bit to understand. I know many of you know this already, but it doesn't hurt. We go back to the book of Exodus when Moses, in, he's first being called, he's first being commissioned to lead these people out of Egypt. And Moses says to, to God, he said, well, when you want me to go to the children of Israel, you want me to go to Pharaoh and tell Pharaoh to let them go, and you want me to tell the children of Israel to follow me out of Egypt. They're going to ask me, who's God? Who is this God? What do, who, what's your name? He didn't even know his name. So God says to him, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am, and the Hebrew word is haya, I'm sure I say that wrong, it's H-A-Y-A-H, has sent me to you. God furthermore said to Moses, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, the Lord, and that word Lord is Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. This is my memorial name to all generations. Now, I, I know that obviously you sitting here and those that are going to listen to me online or that are listening online, I, I, I wouldn't imagine you have, have spent much time reading commentaries about the book of Deuteronomy or that you know, that you would spend your time trying to figure out what the theologians of the past or in the current are saying about it. But it is, it is, if you should have done that, or if you should do that, you will marvel along with me in, under, in, in how, how frequently it's misunderstood. How, how they don't get that the word, the word Lord was the... Hebrew word, Yahweh. He's the unknown God. Most people don't know God's name. I mean, in recent years, thankfully, it has become more understood. But for many years, people didn't know the name of God. It's really, it's, you know, that's not good. The words I am are translated from the Hebrew word, Haya which is the verb to be associated with God's proper name. Yahweh and Haya is translated elsewhere in the Bible 75 times in total as was, come to pass, came, has been, were, happened, become, pertained, and better for thee. So the words I am is a very wise translation in the context, because God is indeed always the existing one. He was, he is, he will always be. So translating it, I am, is pretty smart. That's a good translation. I am. No matter where we are in history, he is there. No matter where we are in location, he is there. He's the great existing one. He's the great eternal one. And that's what his name reflects. I am is a wise translation in the context because God is indeed always the existing one, the eternal one. I am is not God's name, rather it is what he is. His name is translated in verse 15 with the English words, the Lord. They really are the Hebrew word, Yah, we, we believe it's said Yahweh. It's Y-H-W-H. We think it's pronounced Yahweh. God's name is Yahweh, which means the existing one, the eternal one. It says in Exodus chapter 6, God spoke further to Moses and said to him, I am Yahweh. I changed the Lord to the word Yahweh. God said further to Moses, he said to him, I am Yahweh. Yahweh. And I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty, but by my name Yahweh, I did not make myself known to them. He's making it known to Moses, and from henceforth, he wants the world to know his name is Yahweh. I showed you the redundancy in the book of Deuteronomy 550 times. In the Old Testament, almost 7,000 times 
His name is made known. His name is written 7,000 times. And each time, it's either Lord or God. Lord in capital letters or God in capital letters. And that is because they, of the misunderstanding that people did not want to use the name of the Lord in vain, take his name in vain, and they thought it would be a safer translation to translate it Lord. Lord's not a name. Lord is a title. And his name is Yahweh. It says in verse 6, Say therefore to the sons of Israel, I am Yahweh, and I will bring them, out, bring them from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from bondage. I will also redeem you from the outstretched arms and great judgments. Again, my point in, in going back to all of this is so that you understand why the, there is such a, a redundancy in the book of Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy 28, if you wouldn't mind turning there, please. Deuteronomy 28. In verse uh, 58, 28, 58, if you are not careful to observe all the words of this law, which are written in this book, to fear his honored and awesome name, Yahweh your God. Now, I should point out to you, too, that when they translated it, the word Yahweh, Lord, they add the word the. They say the, and there is no the in the Hebrew. It's the word Yahweh. So you leave the the out when you see the Lord in capital letters. The honored and awesome name, Yahweh, your God. I love that phrase. The honored and awesome name. Look at uh, chapter 32. This should really be the heart of every person who worships our God. We should want, verse, verse 3, it says, 32, 3, For I proclaim the name of Yahweh. I proclaim the name of Yahweh. I find great satisfaction, in, or, or I don't know, a great honor and privilege to understand his name and then to use it in my communication to other people. I just got a call yesterday from a guy in jail, and he knew God's name was Yahweh. That's the first time I ever talked to the guy. I don't know how I got my name. It's probably Wendy, one of Wendy's friends. So, uh, but anyhow, uh, most often people are not aware of his name, and, and, and when you read, go through, and, and do a, a, a word search on the word name and the name Yahweh, you will see how he wants his name exalted. He wants his name understood. He wants us to teach it to our children and our grandchildren. He wants the whole world to know his name. So I'm, I'm very happy to speak that name. For I proclaim the name of Yahweh, ascribe greatness to our God, the rock. His work is perfect, for all his ways are just. A God of faithfulness and without injustice. Righteous and upright is he. Isn't that great? I proclaim the name of Yahweh, that name that is honored and awesome. I, and go to Leviticus chapter 22. I, I, I regress from Deuteronomy, but I feel that a couple of these things from the previous books are important as we move forward into the book of Deuteronomy. And uh, in Leviticus Chapter 2, actually I have it up here on the screen. In Leviticus 22, 2, it says, Tell Aaron and the sons to be careful with the holy gifts of the sons of Israel, which they dedicate to me, as to not profane my holy name. I am Yahweh. We don't want to profane God's holy name. We want to respect his holy name. And then in verse 32, it says, you shall not profane my holy name, but I will sanctify the sons of Israel. I am Yahweh who sanctifies you, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am Yahweh. And then uh, in verse 45 of chapter 11, for I am Yahweh who brought you up from the land of Egypt to be your God. Thus you shall be holy, for I am 
holy. I think that this is important as we're going to do a study in the book of Deuteronomy and as we see more and more about God, that we always remember that he is holy. In the book of Leviticus is where this is really pronounced. Over, over 76 times, it's re, the word holy is used. Your definition or our definition of holy or holiness may be dreadfully different than God's. You know, what he thinks is holy could be quite different than ours. All the attributes of God make him who he is because he is holy. What I mean by that is because he is holy, he is loving. And because he is loving, he is justified. He's just. And because he is just, he is merciful. And because he is merciful, he is forgiving. His, his personality, his character traits, they're all connected, beginning with the fact that our God is holy. And because he is holy, he is loving. And so on down the line. You get what I'm saying? He is holy. He's a holy God. Again, if you're studying the Old Testament gods and the Baals and all the rest, they weren't holy, they were filthy. They were, they were, they were vile. They were an abomination. Yahweh is holy. Because he's holy, he requires holiness from his people. His ways are much greater than man's ways. They're much higher than man's ways. We live in a filthy world tarnished by the devil and sinful men. Our surroundings are so unholy, we have difficulty discerning what is holy. We debate what is acceptable in society. And then we pressure acceptance of all kinds of unclean behavior as being normal. That's the world we live in today. Yahweh has no tolerance. Yahweh has a no tolerance policy for unholiness. He has a no tolerance policy for unholiness. Because of his absolute holiness, he is extremely different than man and women. He's different than we are. What he says and what he does are quite often strange or odd to us because his base of operation is always from holiness. So when we're going through the book of Deuteronomy, it might be odd to you. It might not seem, you know, like what you would do. Well, yeah, <laughs> that's right. If we are to gain insight about him, we must be meek and not make him what we want him to be. We don't make God to be what we want him to be. All idolatry emanates from the mind of man molding a God which fits into their understanding and into their desires. The gods that have been invented are invented the way they are because the people wanted that. It doesn't work that way with the true God. You don't invent him. He created you. He created humanity. Idolatry did not cease after the Old Testament. It is just as alive now, and yet perhaps in more subtle way, but it's still there as a part of the world in which we live. Yahweh does not fit into your contrite view of him or your limited view of him. He is not what you make him to be. He's not the God of your understanding. He's not the God of your understanding. He's much bigger than your understanding. Even if your understanding is formulated by your understanding of the Scripture, it is still limited to the God that created the Milky Way galaxy. It's still limited. But most people don't even come close to understanding Him because they don't read the Scripture. Hence, our desire to focus on the wonderful book of Deuteronomy for these weeks that are coming up so that we can get a better understanding of him. And, you know, the, the, the ideal, the, the reason that people built idols throughout history and worshiped those idols the way they did is because they were manageable. They could manage them. They were controllable. These gods represented their desires, their thinking. Well, our God, Yahweh, 
He's not manageable. You don't stick him in your pocket and tell him what to do. You don't control Yahweh. That's not the way it works. He's way beyond your control. He is not manageable. He's the manager. <laughs> He's not the God of your understanding. Your understanding is limited. In Deuteronomy 32, again, I had you go to Leviticus, but go back to Deuteronomy 32. And in um, verse 2, 2 and 3 again, or 3 and 4, I proclaim the name of Yahweh. Ascribe greatness to our God, the rock. His work is perfect for all his ways are just. And then this phrase here, a God of faithfulness. He's a God of faithfulness. Verse 9, for Yahweh's portion is his people. Jacob is the allotment of his inheritance. He found him in a desert, place, desert land, in a howling waste of wilderness. He enriched him, talking about Israel. He cared for him. He guarded him as the pupil of his eye. This is what God did in relationship to Yahweh. Look at me. The pupil of your eye. You can't go like that to your eye and hit your eye. Your, eye, your, your eyelid won't let you do that. Anything comes at your eye, your eyelid automatically closes. It's always protected, right? If not, there's some malfunction, you need help. But normally, most of us can understand. God has treated Israel as the pupil of his eye. His protection was constantly with them. He loved them. He selected them. He wanted them. Like an eagle, verse 11, like an eagle that stirs up its nest, that hovers over its young. He spread his wings and caught them and carried them on his pinions. Yahweh alone guided him, and there was no foreign god with him. He made them ride on high places on the, of the earth, he, and he ate the produce of the field, and he made him suck the honey from the rock and oil from the the flint rock, curds of cows and milk of the flock with fat of, of lambs and rams and the breed of Bashan and goats with the finest of the wheat and of the blood of the grapes you drank wine. In other words, Yahweh loved these people, provided for these people, he protected his people, and he was faithful to his people. Yahweh is a faithful God. Again, a point that is really, really emphasized throughout the book of Deuteronomy. Go back to chapter 1, please. Bec well, I, I'm sorry. Stay in 32. I wanted to show you verse 16. I looked at my notes, and I jumped ahead. 32, 16. doesn't hurt you to go back. 32.16, they made him jealous. He did all that he did for them. He loved them. He was faithful to them. And then verse 16 says, they made him jealous with strange gods. With ab abominations, they provoked him. With, now go back to chapter 4. He was, they made him jealous. There's a different thought about Yahweh that he is a jealous God. In chapter 4, in verse 24, For Yahweh your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. In 5, 8. Chapter 5, verse 8. For you shall not make for yourselves an idol of any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, Yahweh your God, am a jealous God. I am a jealous God. And it says this in chapter 6. It says it over and over again that Yahweh is a jealous God. Why is he a jealous God? Because he's a faithful God. He loved these people. He called these people. He wanted these people. Of all the people on the earth, he called these people, and he was faithful to these people. 
and he was not willing to share them with other gods. And I can, I can understand that. I love my wife with all my heart. I couldn't live my life without her. But I'm not willing to share her with another man. And that's how he felt about his people. He is a jealous God. He is not willing to share his people with other gods. And I, I, I again, in, um, in chapter 1, just trying to give you an overview of some important stuff here. In chapter 1, verse 8, See, I have placed the land before you. Go in and possess it, a land which Yahweh swore to give to your fathers, to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob, to them and to their descendants after them. He's talking to these people who this is, this is hundreds of years after Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. As a matter of fact, Moses, when he first wrote the law, recorded in the book of Exodus, it was 430 years after Isaac was born to Abraham. It's hundreds of years later, and it's repeated here in Deuteronomy numerous times, I'm doing what I'm doing with you because of your fathers. I promised your fathers... He promised Abraham, he cut a covenant with Abraham, he swore to Abraham that he was going to give them the land that they were about to enter in. And he reminds them, the reason that I'm doing this is because I'm a faithful God. I mean what I say, and I say what I mean. I promised your fathers that that their descendants would enter into the promised land. You're their descendants. That's why you're entering into the promised land. He's a God of love. He's a God of faithfulness, and he he remembers his promises. He has integrity. He does not fail to keep his promises. He's not like humans. He's Almighty God. Look at chapter 5. We have that wonderful song, don't we, that unfailing love. Isn't that a song somewhere, a lyric to a song? Or somewhere in the Bible. (laughs) Unfailing love. And if, if uh, maybe as we move further into this, I'll point this out to you, is that, that, that God said, at the latter part of Deuteronomy, he tells them, I know what's going to happen. Eventually you're going to turn against me. And, and you're gonna, you are going to turn to other gods. You're going you're gonna to throw me to the side. But he, but he says to them, I'm still going to be there. And when you repent, and they still haven't, When you repent, I'm going to take you back. As a matter of fact, he has a prophet. The prophets all talk about this, that in the end, it talks about in the book of Romans also, it talks about in the book of Revelation, when Israel is finally reunited with him because he's a faithful God and his love is unfailing. This is the God we want to worship. This is the God we want to serve. In... in, uh, In Deuteronomy chapter 5, I want to leave you with this final thought at this introduction of the book of Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, in verse 4, Yahweh spoke to you face to face at the mountain from the midst of the fire. While I was standing between Yahweh and you at that time, you declared to declare to you the word of Yahweh. For you were afraid because of the fire and did not go down, did not go up to the mountain. He said, I am Yahweh your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourselves an idol of the likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under it. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, Yahweh, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities on the fathers and the children and the third and the fourth generation. But, verse 10, showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. Again in chapter 6, verse 4, Hear, O Israel, Yahweh is our God. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh is our God. Yahweh is one. You shall love 
Yahweh your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your might. These words I am commanding you today and shall be in your heart. Teach them to your children and your grandchildren. What is the purpose of life? Why are you here? Why did God create people? What is the purpose of our lives? Is it to be this or to be that? The true purpose of our life is to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Everything else is secondary, if even that. The most primary thing is to love God. Some of us have been brought up in Christianity. Some of us have come into it recently. My children, my grandchildren are being brought up in Christianity. Me, I came in later in life. I crawled in. I came here because I needed help. I was dying. I needed the help of God. And I found the help of God. And I kept on coming because I had needs in my life. And God kept on meeting my needs. He kept on healing my soul. He kept on giving me purpose. He gave me direction. He gave me what I needed to be a person, to be a man, and to have an abundant life. But there was a time of transition. That was a paradigm switch, living for myself and then depending on Yahweh. And as I've matured, I've understood, based on a lot of what's in the book of Deuteronomy and elsewhere, that my life is not about God ministering to me as much anymore, which he still does, but it's about me ministering to him. It's about me loving him. It's about me glorifying him. That's why I wanted to sing that hallelujah. It's to give him praise, to give him honor, to give him the love that he has so freely given to me and to all of humanity. Our purpose in life is to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We should be saying to him, God, what is it that you want me to do to love you today? Father, we thank you so much for your grace and your goodness, for your love and your kindness. And help us to better understand who you are so that we may do exactly what we're talking about, and that is to love you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Mm -hmm.